right. Hey, welcome, guys. Welcome, uh, especially if you're new. Uh, I know that we've already said that once, but let me just say it again. Uh, we launched Mercy Hill Church six years ago, and if you are new, I promise you, uh, you are one of the thousands of people that we hope to see come through Mercy Hill. Uh, we had you in mind. We know there's a lot of things you could be doing today and that you would invest some time to dig into the Word and to worship with us and our church family. Man, it means a ton to us. So uh, thank you for being here. You can check out our first-time guest tent on the way out. Uh, we'd love to meet you there. We have a gift for you. We'd love to kind of hear your story, hear how you heard about Mercy Hill. Uh, also, hey, if some of you are new, uh, we have a, a process by which you can kind of take that next step with us. Some of you might want to do that, even if this is your first time. We have people that come to the weekend or they're like, man, I've been here for two weeks. Others of you maybe have been here for two years and still haven't gone through the weekender. Um, we have one coming up in September. It's that place, that big giant front door for all of us to connect. So uh, listen, if you're trying to think about like, man, how do I get involved? How do I get questions answered? How do I get connected here? Um, that is the way to do it. So you guys can check that out on our website, all right? All right, if you have a copy of Scripture, I want to invite you to take it out and turn with me to Song of Solomon. Uh, for the next seven weeks, we are going to be doing a deep dive into this book. Uh, honestly, guys, we are going to be dealing with some of the most sensual, uh, hottest, honestly, language in all of poetry, uh, music, you know, all, all of that. And, and it comes directly out of the Bible. I know that's kind of shocking, right? When you think about, man, the, some of the hottest, uh, most sensual language that has been written written coming out of the Bible. We, we don't make that connection. Many of us kind of view God as, uh, as sort of detached and just kind of high and away of anything that mere mortals and humanity would do. Um, but the fact is, man, God created sex. He created desire. He created the categories of manhood and womanhood. And all the way from creation in Genesis, um, these things have been good. They have been broken. They have been distorted uh, by humanity. But the Song of Solomon stands as a real reference point for us to be able to go back to and say, wait a minute, every culture and every generation, we end up getting away from God's design. And when we do that, it ends up being something that was good and powerful and for life ends up being broken and destructive. And that is certainly where we live. Uh, every sermon you've ever heard in your life, I promise you this, okay? Every sermon you've ever heard has a section in it called Build the Need where I stand up here and I try to say, hey, this is why you need to listen to me. Listen to all the brokenness that we have. I'm not sure that I even need to do that today. I mean, do we not realize that the fish bowl, okay, the very water that we're swimming around in, the atmosphere, the air we breathe, uh, it is broken when it comes to sex and sexuality. Uh, an entire generation raised in divorce, infidelity, the average age of someone viewing pornography now is 11 years old. I want you to think about that when nobody's even talked to you about what sex is and you're trying to figure all these things out and this is your first encounter with this, how distorting it is and how broken it is and how messed up it is. See, what goes on, oh, every generation, this is what happens, all right? Every generation, we take certain things from God's design and we try to define them and remake them as if we were God, okay? And what happens is when we allow God to be God and we, we li live by his definitions and boundaries, Things that he intended to be gifts, things that he intended to be enjoyable, pleasurable, things that he intended to be good, stay good. When we try to be God, we do a pretty bad job, and we distort and we break. Man, that is certainly the culture that we're living in. If you're taking notes, this is the big idea today, all right? Sex is beautiful in God's design, but it's broken in our design. One of the things that we are going to see throughout this series is this, sexuality, marriage, desire, pursuit, Manhood, womanhood, <clears throat> these things are incredibly powerful, okay? But look, powerful don't mean good. And hey, you think about things that are powerful. Powerful can be used for good. It can be used for destruction. It can be used either way. And that's how sex is. When it stays harnessed, when the boundaries of it are within God's intention, it is something that is good and life-giving. When the boundaries are dismissed and when the boundaries are crossed and when we redefine it as if we were the ones that made it, it can be incredibly destructive. But y'all, it's still powerful. I want you to think about this illustration with me, all right? Power is power, whether it's good or bad. It can be good for life. It can be destructive. Think about this. 1975, it was August 9th, one o'clock in the morning, 
And there are people that have joined forces. There is a group from a town that is right there. And there's people from the People's Liberation Army of China. And both of them have come together. And they're standing on top of the Ben Cal Dam, desperately trying to pack sandbags and patch holes and get all of these things fixed because Typhoon Nina has sat over the Henan Valley and the Ru River for two days. And the water levels have done nothing but rise and rise and rise until they're at the very top of the dam and the dam is creaking and the dam is cracking and it feels like they're not sure if the dam is going to hold and there are hundreds of thousands of people that are laying at the bottom of that valley asleep. No idea of what is going on and the people are desperately working. They say that about one o'clock in the morning the skies broke and, uh, and all of a sudden the, the stars came out and began to shine and, and the people were, were shouting hooray. The water had started to go down because the rains had stopped and they thought that the dam was going to be saved. Let me ask you something. A dam is the boundary. A dam within creation harnesses life. It harnesses a powerful force, but man, it gives us power. It gives us life and enriches, right? One o'clock in the morning on August 9th, they thought they were out of the woods. People shouted hooray until they heard a large crack. One of the survivors, and there weren't many, said it sounded as if the entire world was collapsing in one second. And 145 billion gallons of water rushed through the Ban Cal down into the Hanon Valley. Now, if you want to try to get a mental picture of what that is, it's 240,000 uh, 240, Olympic-sized swimming pools rushing into this valley. Y'all, it swept away 200,000 people. It's one of the worst uh, disasters, if you want to call it man-made because the dam failed or whatever. It's one of the worst disasters in human history. This is what I think. This is how I'm, I'm viewing this. Guys, a dam like that, the boundary being right, when things are right, this can be life-giving. It's supposed to be good for humanity. But when it is broken, when it is misused, the power of what God intended for good is still there. It's just there for destruction. And church, I'm going to tell you something. You and I right now in our culture, we're pretty much living in the bottom of the valley. That we're looking up at something that God intended for good and it's broken and it's distorted. And all of the destructive forces are crashing into our lives whether we realize it. Some of you are like, man, I know that. I realize it. Why? Because you've suffered abuse. And you understand that sexual abuse is different. You get it because it tears at your soul. Some of you have suffered infidelity in your life, whether it was something that you made a choice or whether somebody was unfaithful to you and you saw how it ripped at your soul. You see the destruction in your kids when you don't realize what's going on because their grades are failing and they're becoming distant and what's actually going on is that someone has introduced them and they've become hooked uh, to cheap imitations of what God intended for good and now are destroying uh, their minds and their psyche and their lives. Young people these days are getting married and they can't figure out what's wrong with their intimacy. It's because they've been trading it for years with a computer screen and all of these things are going on and it's broken and it's flooding our lives. Y'all, the Song of Solomon, it stands as a reference point for us to wake up and to say, man, the water is rushing. We're standing in the bottom of the valley, but God didn't intend this for us. And so we can dive into the book of the Song of Solomon. We can look back. We can see, God, this is your original creation. This is what you have created these things for. Man, desire, intimacy, they are good in their right place. They are good with their boundaries. There really isn't a better gift to humanity. So let's chase those things down. All right, that's what we're going to be doing over the course of this series. Now, some of you are new, uh, and if you're new, let me, let me say this. Most of the time, almost all the time at Mercy Hill, uh, we do what we call expository preaching here. That's a fancy name. All it means is exposing preaching, okay? All it means is I don't come in with a, some grand idea. What we do is we get in the Bible and we pull out whatever that idea is. That's what we try to do in our preaching. Uh, usually it's just like one chunk of scripture and that's the wheelhouse, okay? So I need you to be a little gracious with me. Uh, I'm stepping out of that. I'm trying to do something a little bit different today because I think we need to. What we're gonna do today is set up the whole series, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to overview the Song of Solomon as a book. I'm gonna try to make sure we kind of understand the what and the why and really the who that is being talked about in the Song of Solomon because I feel like if we can get that right in our mind, uh, then the rest of it is gonna flow a lot better over the next six or seven weeks, okay? So uh, man, if, if you're newer, this is not the norm. We normally don't overview huge books like this, but we're gonna do that today to set up the rest of our series. So I got 
three questions for us this morning, and that's it. That's going to be our time together. The first question is this. What is the Song of Solomon, all right? What is the Song of Solomon? The Song of Solomon is a book that was written by one of the wisest men that ever lived, okay? Uh, the Old Testament tells us the story of Solomon, that God uh, gave Solomon desires of his heart, and his desire was great wisdom. And we have the book of Proverbs. We have the book of Ecclesiastes. We have the book of the Song of Solomon. And it's probably written during his reign. Some of the things that are referenced in this book really make it seem uh, like it was written before the kingdom of Israel was divided into the northern and southern kingdom. And so uh, we probably place the dating of this book around 960 B.C. or somewhere like that in, in Solomon. Solomon's reign, all right? Solomon wrote this book for us, and I'm not going to give you kind of a thesis for the book, but let me give you a summation of the book, all right? I think if I was to sum up the entire book, this is how it would read. The Song of Solomon is primarily about the goodness of sexual desire between a man and a woman within the, 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 uh, the design of marriage, within God's design, all right? I think that's primarily what the book is about. The book is about the goodness of desire. See, the world has gotten this wrong and the church has gotten this wrong. Okay, we're going to talk about this throughout the whole series. The world has gotten this wrong because they don't call sexual desire good. They call it ultimate. Wrong. It's not ultimate. It pushes us to something that is ultimate. The church has gotten it wrong because they say, well, it's not good for sexual desire. They've actually called it bad, which is unbelievable when you actually read this book and you read uh, the beginning of the book of Genesis. God has given us this for a gift. It's just that there is a design to it. There are boundaries to it. Sex and desire, marriage, they are powerful forces. They need the boundaries that God has given them to be leveraged and harnessed for good. Now, the book is filled with graphic language, okay? It just is. Uh, we just kind of got to get that right. It's filled, with, it's filled with, uh, with these images and language that really push us to see um, that the goodness of se that sexual desire, a man and a woman within God's design, is a good thing. And listen, I'm not a shock jock preacher. Some of you might be new. You're not sure where I'm going to go with this. If you're here, you know this. I don't do anything for shock value, okay? But at the same time, I'm not going to pull any punches either. <laughs> so what we got to do is just kind of make a deal. I won't try to be shocking, though there's a lot that we could say that could be kind of shocking. I'm not going to be shocking for shock value if you'll allow me to say, look, let's call it for what it is, all right? And so that's the way that we're going to deal with this. Now, let me get in. Let me give you a little taste here, all right? Uh, first, uh, the first chapter of this book, Song of Songs, uh, Song of Solomon, it's called both. Chapter one, look at this with me. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. I mean, we're talking one verse in. We're talking about beer and sex. We're not going to have a Baptist in the house for week two, okay? They gone, right? Uh, hey, it's just what it is. This is what it says, all right? Your oils, your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name is oil poured out. Therefore, virgins love you. Draw me after you. Let us run. The king has brought me into his chambers. Holy moly, okay? Look at verse 9. I compare you, my love, to a mayor among Pharaoh's chariots. That means a horse, okay? The pickup lines a couple thousand years ago uh, were a little different than now. Um, you're going to see this. He's going to start talking about how long her neck is and her teeth look like sheep and all this, okay? So you just got to... Uh, we just sort of got to get over it. Um, your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with strings of jewels, okay? Listen, I just wanted to, I wanted to read this to just kind of give us a little bit of a take. This is kind of what we're talking about, and, and here's what I want. This is sort of the way I want to preface this. Some of these things can be sort of embarrassing for us to get into and talk about in a godly way, all right? Now, that, I think that is very ironic because the, the air that we breathe, the fish tank, the water we uh, live in, the atmosphere around us is hyper-sexualized, okay? I mean, it's the, the water, we, the, the fish tank, the water, the air, just our life streaming through our television, streaming through our, our phones, entertainment, politics, everything on the radio. It's hyper-sexualized. I can't even watch a football game this weekend without my hand on the remote control with my boys in the room because there's going to be a Doritos commercial with a supermodel in a bathing suit eating a potato chip sensually, <laughs> if you can believe that. This is where we live, okay? Now, what's, what's odd is that then we, even though we consume this, even though this is the, where, where we live and breathe every day, then all of a sudden we get sheepish about the biblical language. We get sheepish about talking about these things in, godly, in a godly way. That is so ironic. We've got to be able to just sort of say, man, we're, we're not doing that. 
The, the, the culture has no problem talking about sex. We consume, even if you don't mean to, I mean, just living, billboards, okay? I mean, everywhere you go, you try to check out in and, and a supermarket line. This is the high, I mean, this is the, the air that we breathe. We cannot be sheepish about these things. So when I read this, I, I guess I'll just say it like this, okay? If I can't get through the king has brought me into his chambers, there ain't no way we're going to get through the mountains of myrrh, <laughs> okay, and the pomegranates and the palm trees. What we've got to do is we just have to say, hey, this is what it is. Sexual desire is good within its proper place and within its boundary, and we're not going to be embarrassed to talk about these things. I thought Pastor Gary over at Clifton Road uh, said this the best way. We were talking about how this can be uh, sort of embarrassing, a little bit sheep. I can be embarrassed by it. I've been coaching myself not to be embarrassed by this stuff. Uh, on Monday, people start, anybody who came, if it was a dude, when he came to my office, I just opened the Song of Solomon and I started quoting to them when they, when they walked in. Okay, by day two, everybody's like standing with their toes right outside of my office looking in. <laughs> they didn't want to come here anymore. I've been trying to coach myself uh, to be able to talk about these things. We should be able to read from the Word of God. I thought Gary said it the best way. Here's what he said. He was like, listen, man, we get embarrassed about this stuff. That doesn't mean that we should talk about it less. It means that we should talk about it more. If talking about sex in a godly way embarrasses us, then we need to talk about it more, not less. At home, kids, in relationship, community group, we should be able to talk about these things. And I think this book helps us to stand and recover a, a godly way of talking about it. Man, I don't got to be sheepish. God has created these things. He loves the physical. It is something that he has given to humanity. It points us to him. So let us be able to talk about this. Now, how does the Song of Solomon talk about it? Okay, in other words, all right, so the Song of Solomon stands as sort of a reference for us to get back to God's original design and creation, right? That's what, that's what the what is. It's like, I man, it's a reference point to get back to the original design and creation. Well, if that's true, how does it do it? Let me give you a quick overview of the book. This is nothing that you couldn't read if you got a good study Bible uh, or whatever. You would be able to see these things for you. Maybe you want to chase some of this. Some people believe the Song of Solomon is a linear book. What it means is it's a story that's being told from beginning to end, probably about Solomon and the first wife that he ever had and them coming together. That's fine. Other people have seen in this story three characters, that it looks like Solomon is in the book and he's trying to woo a, a, a girl from the country away from her shepherd lover of her youth and he's trying to get her to come in and to join his harem. Maybe some people look in and they say, hey, much of the book is a dream. It's not meant to be uh, taken as like, hey, this is what happened, but this is a dream. You see that particularly in chapter three when she talks about being on her bed at night and, and this kind of fanciful story begins to happen and maybe it's a dream. But then that raises the question, well, how much is a dream? Uh, is it just a chapter three? Is it half the book? All of these things. Listen, you might have heard of this story before. You might have heard, the, have, have heard this read before. You may have studied this before. You may have strong opinions on exactly the strategy that we need to read this book. I'm going to tell you my strategy in reading this book because as you know, I usually take whatever is simplest. If I would have to know a framework before I ever came to it and I could read it a thousand times and would never get that for myself, I usually reject it. Okay. So for me, it's like when I come to it and I look at it in its simplest form, I'm going to tell you what I think about it, but that doesn't mean it's right. Okay. There's a lot of different ways that people have interpreted this. Either way, the major, the major themes come through no matter how you read it, and that's what we're going to be dealing with in this series. The way I read it, though, is an anthology. All right, and what that means is, is that the Song of Solomon is a song. I mean, how many times have you ever heard a song that was a linear story straight through all the way from beginning to end? Sometimes, okay, but generally when you're thinking about poetry, when you're thinking about music, when you're thinking about artwork, it's not a linear story all the way through. It's snapshots of a relationship. And that's what I think is going on here. I could be wrong, but I think that's what it is. I think what is happening is that Solomon and the, and the first wife that he ever had, as they're coming together, and they're expressing their desire for each other within God's design, okay, that you're seeing snapshots of their relationship, love letters, poetry, uh, you know, song, that kind of thing. So I would say it like this. The Song of Solomon is made up of snapshots of a God romantic relationship. You may totally disagree with that. Like, no, no, no. I always read it this way or whatever. And if that's where you are, I think it's going to be totally fine because the same themes 
are going to come out either way, all right? Bottom line, this book was given to us as a reference point to go back to. God created us male and female. He gave us this idea of coming together as one flesh. Sexuality was his idea. It needs the proper boundaries. It needs the proper framework or else it can become destructive. But the reference point for what it should look like is right here in the book of Song of Solomon. That's the what. Number two, why was the Song of Solomon written? Okay, why was the Song of Solomon written? Well, let me give you the 30,000 foot and then I wanna talk about it in our culture today and this is where I'm really gonna spend most of our time uh, in terms of today's sermon, okay? The, the why, it, there, there's two, I, I guess you could look at it in two ways. All right, when you think about why, you gotta think about universally, All generations, all time, why did God want us to have this book that is a reference for the original design and the goodness of sexuality as he intended in in his creation? Well, this is why, okay? If you think about 30,000 foot, every human generation becomes really, really good at grabbing things that God created, forget the starting point, forget that he created them, and then we recreate them and sort of redefine them and put our own boundaries on them or take all boundaries off of them. We take things in his design and act as if we created it, okay? And and we do that with a lot of things. I mean, we do that with the image of God. It works out in a lot of different ways. Certainly with sexuality in our day, man, there are such distortions. And this is kind of the idea. I think this book was written to let us remember something as humanity that we never need to forget. And this is it. We can't define what we didn't create. Okay, we can't. If we didn't create it, we don't get to say what boundaries are on it. If we didn't create it, we don't get to say what it was supposed to be or not supposed to be or when or where or whatever. If there is a creator involved, then that creator holds all the keys. He holds all the cards in terms of what makes this good and profitable and and, and something that is great for humanity, a good gift. If God created it, and he did, we have to listen to his design or else this powerful force that can be used for good or destruction will get out of the dam. All right, it comes barreling down at us when we decide to abuse and forget and not even worry about the way that he created it. But if we would stay within the design, if we would remember that it's not ours to create and tinker with, then we will be ones who reap the benefits of this. The benefits ultimately are, it's a great gift and through it, we get to see the ultimate giver and that's kind of the idea. All right, so that's the 30,000 foot. Now, let me me say this. We We can't define what we didn't create, right? Every generation wakes up, and this is where we have woken up. In the West, 21st century, uh, all of the media, technology, I mean, it's just a stream. It is a flood. We are hypersexualized, over-sexualized. It's just unbelievable, and I'm going to talk about these things throughout the entire series. But that's where we find ourselves, okay? So when I say, why do we, not just why was it written, But why do we need to get back to this idea that we can't define what we didn't create? I've been reading this book over and over. I've been listening to it. I've been thinking about it for months as we've known this is coming. And I have five cultural misconceptions. The air we breathe, the atmosphere, okay? This is just the the fishbowl that we're swimming around in is is kind of a web of misconceptions. I could probably talk about a thousand of these that are are broken through this book. But I want to talk about five, and I'm just going to mention them now, and we'll We'll end up kind of hitting, touching different ones throughout the rest of this series. If you ask me, why do we, you and I, okay, Clifton Edgefield, why does Mercy Hill in this day and age, why do we need to hear this book? I would say because there are, per, there are pervasive cultural misconceptions. I would border on saying that there are cultural lies, okay, that have crept in even to the church. And this book can help us remember we didn't create sex. We don't get to define it. And it can help us to remember uh, that these things are misconceptions and are not the truth. Let me run through these five, all right? Number one, cultural misconception. There is no binding definition of sexuality and gender, okay? There is no, and what I mean by that is manhood. What I mean by that is womanhood. What I mean by that is God created them male. He created them female, See, for us, this is, the, this is the fish tank that we live in. You can decide uh, whether you're male, female, neither, both, uh, can switch fluid, irregardless of the way that you are put together and created physically, number one. Or, uh, number two, I would say, that we are defining these things by who we choose to have sex with. 
okay? Uh, that, that sex, in terms of what we engage in, is what defines our man uh, masculinity or our femininity, male or female. And I would say, man, no way. I mean, the, the Song of Solomon just patently rejects both of those as misconceptions. And let me kind of show you how it does so. The Song of Solomon, the whole thing is based around giving us a reference point that affirms the original creation, all right, it affirms Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis 1, 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Therefore, man shall, this is chapter 2, leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Here's all that I'm saying. The entire book of Song of Solomon is a reference point that says, hey, I assume that Genesis 1 and 2 is the way that creation is. All right, so Song of Solomon is an outworking. It is an application of affirming Genesis 1 and 2. Now, this is, let me just do a a bit of an apologetic here. I am not saying that we as individuals cannot struggle with those things. Man, the, the, the atmosphere, the, the world is broken. We are broken. Man, we can all struggle in a bunch of different areas. But here's what we can't do, and this is what we try to do, okay? What we try to do is love a no God concept and a real scientific empiricist kind of world when we want it, and then we try to borrow from Christianity when we want it, okay? Now, I'm going to talk about this in the, in the, and actually the first two misconceptions. And what I'm going to try to say is you can't grab from one and then run back to the other, okay? You've got to sort of push to the logical conclusion of either. Now, let me talk to you about this for a minute. If I can say the, the true me is not reflected in my physical being, okay? Like, man, if I was, if I was getting hunted down in a murder, uh, you know, investigation, like, they took my blood, they would be able to say, I'm looking for a man. Like, I'm looking for male. He, there's male. There's, there's, there's manhood there, okay? Now, if I'm able to say, hey, I am not what my physical body is, you realize what I'm saying is there is another part to me that is not physical, and when you make that jump, what you're saying is I've left science and landed squarely in religion. When I have left what is physical and said there is a self to me that is something that is not physical, that is a religious claim. That is a faith claim. It's not a scientific, there's nothing scientific about it. How would you put that in a test tube? How could you put that in a bottle? Science deals with matter. And what we're saying is there is something to me that is not matter. There is something to me that is more than that. And here's all I would say. You know what? The Christian worldview totally affirms that. You're not just body. Your body and soul, there is spirit to you. We are integrated. We are, one, we are whole people, all right? But what we can't do is like science and then like Christianity, grab from one and run to the other. See, here's what you got to think. If what I'm saying is there is more to me than the physical, I've got to realize that if I'm making that religious claim, y'all, God is sovereign over both, <laughs> What I can't say is, well, I'm more than physical, there's another part of me, but I'm, I'm still going to reject that God is over uh, that part of my life. No, if there's another part of you, it's because it was given to you, it's because it was created for a purpose. It was created, and if it was created, then we've got to realize God is sovereign over all of me. He is sovereign over the physical part of me. He is sovereign over the part of me that is not physical. He is sovereign over all of my life, and for some of us, um, that can be a total struggle. I totally understand that, and I know that, man, bro brokenness in this world can, uh, can just manifest itself in a lot of different ways, but it doesn't change that we uh, have got to strive to submit to the Lord and his sovereignty over all areas of our life. Cultural misconception number two actually follows the same lines, which is sex is purely physical, okay? Uh, this is where many of us are. Many of us are just like, man, whatever. Uh, sex is a physical thing, Okay, just like everything else, there's no God, it's just physical, and, and it's, it's funny, you know, when I was in, uh, when I was in middle school, okay, I, I need to look this up, I should have looked it up before this, when I was in middle school, there was a song that came out that I remember, it was so shocking, okay, and I'm not trying to be a shock jock, I already said that, but I, uh, this is the fish tank, okay, this was the song, you and me, baby, ain't nothing but mammals, so let's do it like they do on the Discovery Channel, <laughs> that was the, this is art in America, y'all, okay, this is what we consider to be art. And I remember hearing that as like as a middle schooler and I think, you know what? I mean, do you have any idea how much philosophy is like coming through? I know it sounds stupid. How much philosophy is coming through that? Francis Schaeffer, a Christian philosopher, theologian guy that I, I reference a good bit. This is what he was talking about. When you suspend God, nothing moves up in terms of, uh, of identity and relevance and, 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 all, and, and value. Instead, everything is pushed down. <laughs> 
okay? When you suspend God, you start to suspend the levels and everything gets pushed down, not up. So what happens to us? We become nothing but mammals. Sex is simply physical. You look around at creation and you see, uh, you know, you, where does this follow? Well, it follows Darwinism. You know, many of us kind of, when it comes to sex and when it comes to who we're going to have sex with, it's like, well, I don't really want there to be a God. I just like this idea of like sex is just physical. It's about a physical urge and, and that persists today. Everybody's seen a little Darwin fish that's eating the Christian fish, okay? You've seen that kind of on a, on a, on a back of a sticker or, or, or a car. Here's all I want to say. This is all I want to say to you. I'm going to try to push this for just one second, all right? If that's the mentality that you're coming in with, let me try to challenge you. Let me try to just give you something to think about. And this is what I would want you to think. If you like the idea of Darwinism and survival of the fittest, and sex is nothing more than males competing over females like we would see in Yellowstone or anywhere else, and that's all that it is. You know what I'm going to tell you? I'm going to say this. Man, you love that worldview because you think it lets you have sex with whoever you want. You would hate the world that follows that. You like the worldview, but you hate the world, okay? Because you can't have both. You can't run to Christianity and run, you can't say, well, I love the idea of atheism and Darwinism and survival of the fittest, but then I also want to run over to Christianity and borrow the idea of intrinsic value of all humanity because it don't exist in Darwinism. There's nothing that gives us that, uh, that intrinsic value. We're not pulled up. We're all pushed down. See, when Darwin comes out with survival of the fittest, and this idea, in his book, it was actually called this, The Origin of Species. People don't know. It was actually called The Origin of Species on the Preservation of Favored Races. Okay? That's the idea. The idea is, man, that, that, that certain things will emerge. Now, granted, he was talking about nature and all of that. You realize that before him and after him, immediately people saw that and began to apply it to humanity. They began to apply it to societies. They began to say, wait a minute, they're not fit, and they're not fit, and as a society, they're not fit. And you have guys like Francis Galton, who was a, car, a, a cousin of Darwin, that immediately came out with eugenics. Like, man, we should think about sterilization, and we should think about all of these things. Why? Because they're not fit, and we're trying to evolve, and we're trying to survive, and we're trying to become strong. So if there is no God, and there is no intrinsic value in humanity, it's all about this pursuit to survive and to become stronger, then we're going to make the call that you're not fit, and that you're not fit, and that you're not fit. And I know what happens when I start talking about this. People are like, yeah, yeah, you know, that was like 100 years ago ago or whatever, and, and that's not really the world that follows these idea claims and all that. Oh, really? You realize the nation of Iceland has aborted its way to about a 0% birth, birth rate among Down syndrome people. Where do you think that comes from? And of course, I'm passionate about it, being the father of a child with Down syndrome, right? Uh, you, you say, oh, well, that's 100 years ago. You're talking about Darwin. You're talking about Iceland. Oh, no, no. Let's talk about here, okay? 1920s, 1930s, very public speaker, very public writer, uh, different speeches, all this kind of stuff, all this public record. It'll try to get hidden, but you can go and find it pretty easily. And she has all of these ideas, many of them about eugenics, many of them like this. Okay, and I'll just give you a couple of quotes from different speeches. Here, here's, here's one that I thought was pretty telling. We should shut down all immigration into our country unless the people that we're letting in come from, quote, fit countries. And they're not, and this is exactly what she said, and we make sure beforehand that nobody who comes in is either an idiot, a moron, all of this kind of stuff, okay? So let's shut down immigration unless it's from the countries that we decide that are fit enough, okay? Oh, how about this idea? Uh, the idea that was prevalent in the 20s and 30s that she also talked about was Man, uh, people that are unfit and deemed that way, physically defective, mentally defective, let's go ahead and either give them a choice of one of two things. Either they can be sterilized so that they don't pass on their unfitness, or they can be, this is unbelievable, you go back and read it for yourself, segregated onto farms where they can begin to learn to farm and be productive out of the way of the rest of society as we continue uh, to, and you say, well, that was a long time ago and all that, and you probably think it was probably from some uh, crackpot far-right terrorist group. Actually, no, the writer of those things was the woman who founded Planned Parenthood. You know, so if you think about it, and you're, and you're like, well, it was far away long ago, what do you mean? Why do you think abortion clinics show up in the poorest sections of all of our cities? 
See, these ideas, they continue to persist. Here's all I'm saying, all right? And I know, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking to yourself like, man, I don't agree with any of that stuff. I know you don't. But the fact that you don't should show you you're taking one from this side and then one from this side. You're saying, I like the idea of no God when it comes to sex because I can have sex whenever I want. I like that worldview. But you don't want the world that follows that. And that should show you that there's a rub there. And I hope that maybe you will chase that down. Number three, cultural misconception is that God doesn't like sex. What do you mean he doesn't like sex? He created it. Okay, God created the physical. I want you to think about this. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 3. As an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. With great delight, I sat, I want you to think about that. With what? Great delight, I sat in his shadow, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. Any of you have kids? Any of you have uh, little nieces and nephews? Anybody you got a uh, little brother and sister? There is nothing better in the world then handing a child a gift that they receive in gratitude, novel, okay, uh, that they receive in gratitude and that you watch them enjoy. It's like the greatest thing in the world as a parent. What do you think God, as he looks upon his children, when he sees the, this woman, what is she saying as she's looking at the lover? What she's saying, or her beloved, she's saying, with great delight, I sat in his shadow, that this is delightful. I'm supposed to enjoy this. It's supposed to be a gift that God has given us, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, all things to his glory, whether that's food, whether it's drink, whether it's sex, whether it's college football, okay, whatever it is. We're supposed to enjoy things to his glory, and many of us have this idea that if there is enjoyment in something, I'm supposed to get away, and God's probably looking in, and, he, and, and I'm like, man, i got to do this before God kind of finds, and, 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 and he doesn't want me to enjoy the things that he has given me in life. No, that's not true. He wants us to enjoy these things. Do you know that Walmart has come out with baked beans that are soaked in Dr. Pepper? I mean, come on. Have you seen this? <laughs> has anybody seen this? If any of you feel the need to get up and run out and get in your car and drive to Walmart, I forgive you and God forgives you, okay? <laughs> if you got to just go <laughs> right now. It's actually causing quite a stir because the can is white with red lettering exactly like a Diet Dr. Pepper can. So people are popping it thinking they're getting Diet Dr. Pepper and they get a mouthful of baked beans. <laughs> so it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. Um, all things to enjoy. Some of you guys are like, this is the weirdest church I've ever been to, okay? <laughs> All I'm saying is God has given us this creation to continue to create. He has given us this creation uh, to continue to enjoy things. God, guys, he wants us to enjoy. When we think about sex and all of these things, pursuit, marriage, God has created them as a gift for us that we would enjoy them and that we would see him in them. Number four, all right, we got to move here. Number four, sex should have no boundaries. Let me just say this and I'm going to move all the way on, all right. Solomon had a thousand women in his life. 700 wives, 300 concubines. Now, we're going to talk about this later in the series. Can you imagine the commoditization of this? Oh, every single body type, every single hair color, every single, I mean, it's like you're, doing, it's like you're clicking through something here. It's like pornography. It's just this idea of, of, of I'm kind of building someone. It's not a human, you see. Thousand women in his life, anytime, all the time, whatever he wanted. And when he came to write his book, what did he write about? The one time that he did it within God's design, the first marriage. You see, that, and that's kind of the point. What we think is, man, there should be no boundaries. Throw off all restraints, sex, marriage, desire, pursuit. It's powerful, whether it's good or bad. Powerful for good, destructive when it's bad. And Solomon knew that because in the book of Ecclesiastes, he wrote about this. I have experienced everything there is. He was the richest, wisest, all of these things in his life. And he went out and he tried to experience the world. And when he came back, he said, it's meaningless. It's vanity. And when he writes about it, he writes about the first one. Number five, y'all, cultural misconception, and we're going to move on, is that sex is ultimate. That's the lie. All right. Here's what I want you to see from the Song of Solomon throughout this whole series. There is something, church, that you cannot live without. There is a beauty that you must seek and attain, but it is not sex. Some of us think, I can't live without sex. Sure you can, because it's not the ultimate beauty. It's not the ultimate thing that you were created to find your home in, to find your rest in. When sex is ultimate in our lives, let me tell you what it looks like. Sex is ultimate to us. It looks like throwing off all restraint. It looks like sex in a dorm room with somebody that you don't even know. It looks like sneaking around the house, texting and emailing with somebody that's not your spouse. 
It, sex come, becomes ultimate. It, it, it looks like watching pornography over and over and over. It, what, what is happening? I've lost control. I'm running after this. I've got to have it. Man, you're not ruling it. It's ruling you because it's become ultimate. Whatever's ultimate in our life dictates, dictates to us what we will do and what we will not do. Sex was never meant to be that thing in your life that was ultimate. Instead, it was meant to point you to what was ultimate. And that's what we're gonna say, the third and final question. Y'all, who is the Song of Solomon really about? Who is it actually about? I'm gonna run through some things here as we close. I'm gonna tell you something. When you start talking about sex and how it fits into God's design and really how it begins to fit into his relationship with us, I'm just gonna be honest with you. This thing gets deep fast. Okay, it gets theological, it gets philosophical. I'm gonna run through it here, and if you're like, man, I feel like I didn't catch all that, that's fine. Come back. <laughs> we're, gonna be, we're gonna be running through these things for the entire series. Y'all, sex is ultimately not about sex. Marriage is not ultimately about marriage. These things are about God. They're about our relationship with him. They're about us finding our eternal rest in him. They are signposts. They point us to what is ultimate. They are not ultimate. Sex should point us to what is ultimate. It is not the ultimate thing. C.S. Lewis talked about it like this. Beauty is never meant to be found in the thing itself. And this is what we do. We take whatever it is, a piece of art, a job, money, sexuality, and what we begin to think is this thing is the good. It, the beauty is in it, and we elevate it higher than it is supposed to be, and it ends up ruling us, but it's not God. What C.S. Lewis talks about, and I think this is so right, is that the beauty is not in the thing. It's not ultimate. The beauty shines through the thing, and that's what it is with sex. That's what it is with marriage and desire. Many of us are holding sex as being ultimate in our life. You're missing the beauty because you think sex is the beautiful thing. No, the ultimate thing is supposed to shine through it. That sexuality is a great gift for humanity. One, because it's pleasurable, I understand. The other is because through it, we see what we were actually created for. We see the beauty, which is an, an intimate relationship with the Lord our God. Here's what I mean, all right? This is, this is, is kind of how it all comes together. The Bible begins with a marriage. And you know what? It ends with one. And Revelation 19 is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation chapter 21, the city, the new heavens, the new earth, they come descending down. And what does the scripture say? The scripture says that the city was adorned as what? It was adorned as a bride for her groom. The Bible begins with the marriage and it ends with the marriage. The intimacy that we seek is not with each other, though it is a great gift that God has given us and certainly is for our good when it stays within its proper boundaries, but it is not ultimate. The ultimate thing that we seek is really what comes out in the Song of Solomon. It's just you gotta take the next step. See, what happens in the Song of Solomon is this. Through the whole book, here's what we know. Man, what's happening? The groom is looking at the bride and he is saying, you are beautiful to me. Man, you are perfect to me. Everything about you is right. Why does he go through list after list after list of saying you are perfect, you are beautiful, everything about you pleases me? Do you know why? Because the groom is looking at the bride. Every single one of us have a desire deep in our heart, whether you're a man or a woman, to have God look at us that way. That's what we lost in the garden. As soon as we sinned, y'all, as soon as sin came into the world, we lost that gaze of God upon our life that is accepting. And the one thing that we want more than anything in the world is to be fully known and fully loved. Okay, not love without being known. That's just totally superficial. But the worst rejection in the world is to let your guard all the way down and say, this is all of me. This is who I am. And to have somebody look back at you and say, then I don't love you. See, what we want is to be known and to be loved. And the gospel of Jesus Christ in this second marriage, what all this is pointing to is that God has given us a way. He has provided a way that he would look upon us in full knowledge, every sin you've ever committed, every sexual sin, everything you've ever done wrong in your life. He would still look at us, but he would look at us through the eyes of this uh, groom as he is staring at his bride. That's what, God, that's what Jesus has come to do. You know, you might be newer today and you're like, man, I, you know, I was you know, vacation Bible school or whatever when I was a kid and Jesus on the cross and I get all that. You ever heard this term if you're from the South? You've heard this term before. Are you washed in the blood, okay? You've heard that before in your life. You know what it means? Man, for people, somebody that's not a Christian, that's like the weirdest thing they've ever heard in their life, that you would be washed in the blood. But you know what it means. It means that when Jesus came, that he died on the cross, he didn't do that to recognize beauty in you. 
See, this is the Song of Solomon. And then you gotta take a step deeper. The Song of Solomon is, Solomon is recognizing beauty in the bride, but Jesus, who is the true Solomon, has not come to recognize our beauty. He has come to make us beautiful. That is what he has done through washing us with his blood. That he would say, everything that you have done, I will go and I'll go to the cross. I'll pay the penalty for all of your sin. And then you come and you join me. I cover you with my robes. And now when God looks upon you, what you want most out of life is to be fully known and fully loved. Well, how about this? How about I die for your sin? You come into a relationship with me and the God of this universe, when he sees you, he sees perfection. He sees me. He sees all. You're no longer defined by your greatest failures. You're not going to be defined by all the times that you gave yourself away and, 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 and all of these things. You're going to be defined by how God sees you now, which is washed in my blood, covered in my robes of righteousness. That is the desire of every one of our hearts. And that is ultimately what the Song of Solomon is about. All right, I'm, I'm out of time. Listen, some of you guys are like, man, head's kind of spinning, uh, still trying to get out of here so I can go get those Dr. Pepper baked beans and all that. And, uh, and, and listen, if that's where you are, man, give it a shot. Hey, what if, what if in six weeks, maybe you totally reject it, but what if in six weeks I could really show you exactly what God intended for sex and marriage and design and pursuit? Wouldn't that be worth even just knowing, all right? Even just having your back of your mind. All right, so I hope that you'll come back to this. Others of you in here, though, listen, I know others of you in here are like, man, fine, great sermon, all that stuff, but here's what you're thinking. You're thinking, I don't think I can sit through six or seven weeks of feeling like this because maybe you feel crushed. You feel like you've sinned. You feel like somebody has sinned against you. You're not sure you can talk about these things. And what I want you to hear, what I want you to hear is this. I know you might feel crushed when we start talking about sexual sin, whether it was your sin or somebody else's against you. But you know, you're not the one that was actually crushed. On the cross, Jesus was crushed. And Jesus saw every sexual sin that you would either commit or that would be committed against you. He saw all of these things from beginning of time. And he went to the cross anyway to call you a precious son or a precious daughter. And you know what? You're thinking, yeah, but I, I mean, I've been, uh, there's abuse. People have sinned against me. You know what? Even their sin is not bigger than the cross. Somebody will pay for that sin. Either, either Jesus on the cross, they'll put their faith in him, and, and even the cross can wash this away in their life. But if they don't, then they'll pay for it in all of eternity in hell. <laughs> One way or another, it will be paid for. Either way, you don't have to hold on to it. Okay? So I know you might feel a little bit crushed. Man, come, come back. Let's continue to dive in. Let's continue to think through these things. All right? Let's pray. Father, we come before you now, and as we go into a time of communion, Lord, I just pray, um, God, that we will experience freedom. Lord, I pray that many of us will let some things go. Uh, we might let some things go <clears throat> about uh, guilt that we've held on to from our past sin. God, I pray that we would trust that Jesus has made us beautiful. Lord, I, pr I pray maybe that we would let some things go about cultural misconceptions that we just want to hold on to. Father, I pray that we would see in these elements and... and uh, God, as we hold in our hands the representations of the body of Christ, what it took for you to make us beautiful, to make us your bride. And Lord, I pray it would break us. God, it would cause repentance. It would cause confession. And we would walk out of here in right relationship with you. In Christ's name, amen.